NACDL is the Association of the Nation's Criminal Defense Bar. Welcome to Policing Black Bodies, a discussion on race and the criminal justice system. My name is Bonnie Hoffman. I'm the Director of Public Defense for the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. Today's program is co-sponsored by NACDL, the Association of Prosecuting Attorneys, the National Center for State Courts, and Research Tri Triangle Institute International. The events that are unfolding across our country today renew a longstanding call for fundamental changes to our nation's institutions. While today's cries carry the echoes of protests following the deaths of Michael Brown, Freddie Gray, Tamir Rice, Eric Gardner, and so many other black people killed by police, the current story of race, racism, and white privilege in America has its roots firmly planted in over 400 years of history. Our conversation today will examine the ways in which the chattel slavery system of America's early history manifests itself in the variety of ways in which black people are literally and figuratively policed today. It is my honor to turn this program over to civil rights attorney Robert Patillo, who will moderate today's conversation. I want to thank you so much, Bonnie, for, uh, for inviting me into and having me. I want to thank everybody who took time out of their day for the very important conversation. Again, I am Robert Patillo. I'm a board member of NACDL, executive director of the Rainbow Push Coalition, Southeast Region, Atlanta, Georgia, uh, radio host on WAOK. Uh, really looking forward to a great conversation. Uh, not to belabor the point, but I want to get to our guest. Um, we have Professor Emeritus of uh, American Ethics Studies and Sociology at Wake Forest University, uh, Professor Earl Smith, and also uh, Professor Angela Hattery, PhD, who is the Professor and Director of Women's and Gender Studies at George Mason University. They are the authors of Policing Black Bodies um, and are uh, esteemed guests for today. Uh, so I want to go to Earl and uh, and Angela uh, and welcome you guys. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, and I, I'm going to turn the floor over to you because you guys really uh, you came on my show Sunday. We had a great conversation. You guys have a, a really wonderful presentation uh, for the uh, for the attendees today. And then after the presentation, we're going to go into some Q&A uh, and, and really dig down deep into what you guys are founding uh, in policing black bodies and how that relates to the current political and socioeconomic situation in this country. So I'll turn it over to you, uh, uh, Professor Smith and Professor Hattery. Good, thank you very much. We wanna thank all the sponsors of this webinar, but we also wanna send a special thank you to uh, Bonnie, to Monica, to Sharice, to Monica, and also for attorney Robert Patillo for agreeing to moderate our session this afternoon. Um, this is a difficult time in American society it is a difficult time for Americans to articulate their feelings about race. They are struggling. Yet we know that race is in every policy, every institution, and every practice in the United States from the three-fifths compromise to the electoral college to admissions practices in our colleges and universities. Race is there. We also want to note that our book is not about hating the police. The book is not about defunding the police. And the book is not about getting rid of police, as you've been hearing over the last six weeks or so. We never address those topics in the book, and we won't address them here this afternoon. Uh, if you can't have difficult conversations in American society about race, uh, why? If we can't say policing black bodies, what can we say? Where does that leave us in our society? Should we whisper? Uh, be advised, we're sociologists, and what we do for a living is observe our surroundings. We pay attention to families, for example. 
We pay attention to what's going on in our schools. We pay attention to what's going on in the workplace. And importantly, we pay attention to what's going on in society. Taken together, what all this means is that we are living under a regime currently that tosses around negative stereotypes about black people and anti-black sentiments while also pushing out white supremacist ideologies. Yes, we're gonna talk about race this afternoon and we believe in facts. Why did we write this book? Like many Americans, the power of the 21st century is the ability for regular citizens, as well as journalists, to stream live into our living rooms or through our cell phones or on Facebook to tell us what's happening out there in America, especially as this pertains to violence that is perpetrated against Black bodies. Like many of you, we sat transfixed as Mike Brown lay in the street for hours we watched as Philando Castile was executed by a police officer while his girlfriend was streaming this live on Facebook in front of their four-year-old daughter. The officer, like so many police who kill unarmed Black men, unarmed Black people, was acquitted. And hence, we watched as marches protested in Chicago as marches protested in Minneapolis, Ferguson, and in Baltimore. We watched the CVS pharmacy in Baltimore burn. But for all the watching, what was missing from all the commentary was both the key element and the elephant in the room, race. Sure, we saw Black people fighting for the right to live freely, and we saw mostly white police officers fully militarized, firing rubber bullets, tear gas at protesting bodies in attempts to break up the protests. What we saw was race, but no one was talking about it. As protests unfolded and images of burned out stores being looted flooded our television screens and more recently our Facebook and Twitter feeds Commentators, almost always white, express shock and outrage that Blacks are destroying their own communities. Again and again, we heard this. Why would Blacks in Ferguson, in Baltimore, in Minneapolis, in Seattle, burn the only stores in their neighborhood? But what none of the talking heads asked is why? Why was there only one store in the neighborhood. We wrote our book to connect the dots, to demonstrate the policing of black bodies is not an isolated event. Where black bodies are policed, we see most, if not all of the various forms of policing, and we interrogate these in the book. From mass incarceration, to the extraction of prison labor, to the school to prison pipeline, to the policing of women's and trans bodies in and out of prison, to men sentenced to decades in prison for crimes they did not commit. This evening, we are going to talk about how we got here. From the very beginning, Blacks have been tied up as unfree people. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those are powerful words. They come from the third president of the United States. Here you see three bullet points on what most school kids before the ninth grade know about Thomas Jefferson. And here on this slide, you see three other bullet points 
on what most adults don't know about Thomas Jefferson. One, he's a slave master. He owns people. Two, he's a rapist. Three, he reneged on manumitting his slaves upon his death, July 4th, 1826. So why do we begin here? We begin here because in order to address the pressing social issues that we're all paying attention in the news, we really need to start at the beginning, at the foundation of this country. Americans like to think of ourselves as great. Politicians tell us we are lucky to live in the richest country in the world, which we do. We are rich for many reasons. We have natural resources, access to international shipping lanes, but we are also rich because the colonists and founders of this nation decided that amassing wealth was worth making a Faustian bargain, a deal that not only rested on exploiting slave labor, which many of our European neighbors also did, but in the US, we took it one step further. We commodified black bodies as literal commodities, as chattel, like sheep and horses. This is property that could be bought and sold. And many people are well-versed in the slave trade, the buying and selling of slaves and the ripping apart of families. But what we talk less about is the fact that vast amounts of wealth accrued to families, communities, and indeed this nation by owning people. People. We know from historical records that enslaved bodies were used just like any other property, land or livestock to, to, to secure loans from banks like Wachovia. Universities like Georgetown and Brown and UVA, you might have heard of some of these, owned slaves who did not only do the work of building the campuses, but they were also used as collateral to buy land and supplies to build those buildings. Heck, students at UVA brought the slaves they owned to campus with them. Think about that on move-in day. Defining black bodies as less than fully human is a political decision, but it needed to be justified by ideology as well, that black people were in fact less than fully human. The political construction of race impacts policies and practices like segregated schools and segregated housing. The colonists and founders also faced a dilemma, as Dr. Smith pointed out with regards to Thomas Jefferson, in that they were raping enslaved women and could not allow the children born of those unions to be free. Thus, in 1662, in the Virginia House of Commons, a ruling which was adopted across the South codified into law that legal, the legal status free or enslaved, passed only through the mother and not the father. This went against every system of patrilineal descent that had been in places across Europe and Asia for centuries, maybe since the beginning of time, a system that the colonists were certainly aware of. All children, this is according to the, what was passed in the Virginia House of Commons, all children born in this country shall be held bond or free only according to the condition of the mother. The ideology that supports this political construction of race creates a host of stereotypes and beliefs about black people that leads to both symbolic policing and implicit bias. A hundred years later, at the founding of this nation, the founders had the opportunity to rectify this decision, but they chose not to. The three-fifths compromise, which we would call the moral compromise, reestablished the legal category of the enslaved as less than fully human three-fifths of a person. The founders believed that keeping the southern states in the union was more important than the decision to extend citizenship rights to, to the very enslaved bodies that built this nation. A compromise only white people could make. Black bodies didn't have the power to make the compromise. For another hundred years or so, until 1870 more or less, black bodies had the same legal standing as farm animals. They were to cop the language of philosophers, both legally and socially dead. So when we talk about race, we know we're talking about a very difficult topic. And here we want to point out through several examples how difficult it is. On your screen, you see a, a portrait of Dr. Gregory Williams. Uh, he wrote this book, fascinating book, called Life on the Color Line, the True Story of a White Boy Who Discovered He Was Black. Williams was raised in an interracial family in Virginia during Jim Crow. This was an illegal union. Through what sociologists call the socialization process, 
Williams, Gregory Williams, his brother Mike, they grew up white. His dad, Anthony, passed as Italian, and his mother is white. A nasty divorce saw his mom, Mary, leave the tavern owner, alcoholic dad, behind. So in 1955, after the tavern went bust, Anthony, Greg, and Mike got on a Greyhound bus headed west. As the bus got closer to Muncie, Indiana, Anthony pulled his boys further to the back of the bus and said this. My father said to me that we were going to be staying with his family, a family I knew nothing about. Do you remember Miss Sally? I remembered a Miss Sally. She was a tall, thin, black woman who would come into and out of our lives. She was our maid, our cook. She was around, but we didn't know who she was. My father says, well, that's my mother and that's your grandmother. That means you boys are part colored, using the language of the time, and I'm colored. Indiana, you're going to be colored boys. In Virginia, you were white boys. Now, you're not any different today than you were yesterday, but in Indiana, people are going to treat you differently. Greg Williams is an example of the one drop rule. Once the decision was made to establish political and legal categories of slave and freed, the colonists had to come up with rules to determine who would be in which category. And this leads to the literal invention of the racial categories of white and non-white. White people equals free equals citizen. Black people equals not free equals not citizen. Americans like to think of themselves or ourselves as innovators and inventors. And in fact, we are. With the stroke of a few pens, the U.S. literally in invented the concept of race. We are so steeped in it that we often don't stop to think about how other countries handle race. Basically, they don't. They may ask about immigration status, religion, other social categories, but not race. In fact, the recent Black Lives Matters protests in European countries have led Americans to ask, how do Black people fare in places like Canada, our neighbor to the north? And the answer is, we don't know, because Canadians don't categorize people in racial terms, at least not legally, not on the census. Now, that doesn't mean they don't experience discrimination, but it's not a legal status. Black people coming to the U.S. from the Caribbean, for example, are often shocked when they arrive in the U.S. and are referred to as Black, not as Puerto Rican or Dominican. Colorism exists, yes, but not race, not a racial hierarchy of human value. And in the United States, no amount of white ancestry can confer whiteness. This is the essence of the one drop rule. Remember the decision in 1662? One drop of black blood and you are black. We often talk in our classes, we give this example. It's really interesting that a white woman can have a black baby, but a black woman can never have a white baby. So in our book, we use the term policing to mean not only the literal use of police force to control the behavior of black people by arrest, incarceration, murder, and so forth, but also to mean control, regulation, surveilling of black bodies, how black people are allowed to be, where black people are allowed to go, when and what choices black people are allowed to make. This is something we call symbolic policing. Policing black bodies also means surveilling to the extent, let me give you this example. Colin Kaepernick, a quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers, found that his black body was policed and surveilled when beginning in 2016, he elected to peacefully express his concern over police brutality against black people by refusing to stand when the playing of the national anthem. By conceptualizing policing more broadly, we have been able to identify more clearly the variety of ways in which black bodies are controlled by a variety of anti-black systems that restrict black people's movement, like 
getting shot while jogging. I should also point out that Kaepernick was moved out of the NFL. He couldn't receive a contract. And owners, 32 owners agreed on this. And just recently, the commissioner gave this lame apology for banning Kaepernick from the NFL. So one of the things that's become very popular um, with the protests going on around the nation and, and around the world is the discussion of whiteness. Um, and Peggy McIntosh uh, developed a tool many years ago to introduce the concept of white privilege. You can see some of the items from her inventory on the slide. The total inventory contains 50 items. The full inventory will be, be made available after the webinar and some post webinar resources. Individuals answer these 50 items by giving themselves one point if the item is true and zero points if the item is false. So scores can range from zero to 50. So for example, I can go shopping alone most of the time, pretty well assured that I will not be followed or harassed. I would score that a one because that I agree with that statement. So with Bonnie's help and Anita's help, we invited folks to complete the inventory ahead of time and send us a selfie with their score. What you see is a demonstration of white privilege. White people's scores are significantly higher than black people's. Of course, the cool thing about this tool is that you can also capture intersectionality of privileges that accrue by gender, sexuality, gender identity, ability status, religious practice, immigration status, and so on. That's, not, that's why not all of the white people will score a 50. We encourage you to complete the inventory yourself, by, but completing the inventory is just the first step. The next step is to talk about the inventory and score it with people who are different from you. Ideally, not just racially, but also in terms of gender, sexuality, gender identity, ability, status, etc. And you'll see the different axes of privilege and how they shaped our lived experiences. It's useful in classrooms, on work teams, offices, and faith communities that are doing racial healing work. The key is, in order to be useful, the group of people discussing the tool must be diverse. We've used this in classes many, many, many times and found it to be incredibly useful. What you'll find, for example, is the ways in which white privilege insulates white people and disadvantages black people as they go about doing their jobs. In our business of higher education, uh, folks come up for tenure and somebody might say of the black colleague, why didn't they publish more? That's actually not the right question. If you did the white privilege exercise, you would realize that those black colleagues have spent a lot of time and energy ensuring their safety and well being that white colleagues didn't have to do. They have to schedule extra parent teacher conferences to be sure that their child is seen in the classroom. Their partner may not feel comfortable with them working in the office late at night or on weekends for fear they will be harassed by campus police. They may worry that their partner won't make it home after an evening jog or that their son won't return from a local bodega where he went to pick up some Skittles and iced tea. Their white colleagues don't have to worry about any of this. And with that extra time and intellectual energy and space, they spend not doing that extra work or worrying, they are able to publish more papers. So the real question isn't, why did the black co colleague publish less? The real question is, what responsibilities did the white colleague not have so that they could publish more? See what happens when we flip the question?
see from that video, um, it's a lot. And we encourage you to watch it again when you have more time to think about it. It's important to note that white privilege, though, isn't just individual. It's also structural and intergenerational. Um, here's one example that comes up in the video of intergenerational uh, white privilege, the accrual of white privilege. College admissions. Wonder why so many first generation college students are black? One reason is because it wasn't until about 40 years ago that the last of the elite colleges opened up their doors to black people. And they did so reluctantly. UVA didn't admit black students until 1972. And that's not to negate the important role that HBCUs played in educating generations of black folks, but it is to note the widespread access to college wasn't available to black people. Those seats were saved for white people. How does white privilege accrue to communities? Here's one example. We build factories and locate toxic waste dumps in black communities. You don't find these in white communities. These drive down home values, not to mention the grave health implications brought to light by books like Death at an Early Age and Savage Inequalities, both written by Jonathan Kozel. Good resources to check out. The million dollar question, do white, poor white people have white privilege? And the answer is yes and no. They don't have class privilege, but they do have race privilege. They're not stopped and frisked more frequently uh, than other people. They can buy a home in any neighborhood they can afford. They're more likely to get rehab than jail. They're not shot disproportionately by the police. And they have significantly more wealth. All of these are just some examples that white privilege accrues to all white people differentially, of course, but it accrues to all of them. Um, one of the most powerful ways in which white privilege accrues is through wealth. As you can see in the chart, at every income distribution point, the top 10% all the way to the bottom, 20% of the income distribution, white people have substantially more wealth than their black counterparts, on average 10 times more wealth. And that's true even among poor whites and poor blacks. Poor blacks have so little wealth that it doesn't even really register on the graph. Um, and this is mostly because of things like home ownership and other assets that white people have been able to accrue because of white privilege and housing covenants and all of that stuff for, for centuries. And we can come back to this chart if people have questions because it's a little complicated, but this becomes really important when we think about things like bail and pretrial detention. So there's a cost for being black. There's a cost for being black in American society today. Uh, part of the course you saw when the officer put his knee on George Floyd's neck. That's a cost for being black. There are health costs. One of the things that's happening with uh, the transparency, say, of the last six or seven weeks is that a lot of information is coming out about many of these things that we've known about for years that people are saying, oh my gosh, I never knew that. So we make the point here that some of the leading medical journals who would never publish peer-reviewed research about Black Americans are doing so now. The New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet, JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, all within the past six or seven weeks have been publishing articles telling us about the cost of being Black and how this impacts health. This COVID virus, this nasty virus that's, that's doing unbelievable things in our society and around the world, many of these articles reveal that the cost of being Black impacts blacks and other uh, non-whites in ways that you could never have predicted. So there's a high health cost for being black. Um, James Baldwin, the famous novelist said, and I quote, to be a Negro, using the language of the time, in this country and to be relatively conscious is to be in a rage almost all the time, end of quote. Ibrahim Kendi put it this way, to be black and conscious of anti-black racism is to stare into the mirror of your own extinction, end of quote. 
I'm putting it this way. To be black is to be invisible. To be black is to be invisible. We don't generally tell uh, personal stories in our research. We don't do it at all. Uh, and we don't do it in the classroom, but I'm gonna say something here that's more personal than, than what I normally would do. Um, after years of going after a bachelor's degree, years of working and gaining a master's degree, many years of working and gaining a doctoral degree, um, my professional status is cemented into who I am, a professor, a named professor who have worked at several types of colleges and universities in the United States. So I own a home. I'm raising my kids. I'm working, teaching, and researching. But in the summer, I have a garden. I have a lawn. I'm outside working in the garden trimming flowers, et cetera. And across 10 years, at least 10 years, every summer, at least six of those 10 years, someone would walk by and say in a very nice voice, hey coach, what's the team look like this year? And I would utter, silence. And you may not think that this is a point to be made in a webinar like this, but it is. Um, also, more recently, in a high-end townhouse neighborhood just outside Washington, D.C., I'm working in my yard, uh, toiling, fooling with flowers, what have you. And a fellow a white male who walked by my house at least a hundred times, uh, pulling his dog, uh, strolling through his phone, morning, afternoon, walk by, some days he might not, some days he might not. On this given day, I'm bending over the flower bed and he stops and he says, how much do you charge for doing that? And again, I'm essentially silent. Um, that's unbelievable. And then Professor Hatter is gonna tell you why it matters. So why does representation matter? The white privilege exercise, if you recall from the slide, uh, some of the questions are about, are, do you see yourself represented in the media? For white people, we do see ourselves represented in the media in a wide range of roles and occupations. This is not the case for black people who are most often depicted as thugs or criminals. Think about how many times you've heard the word thug when the talking heads or even heads of state describe protesters. This constellation of images results in implicit bias. The neighbors see Dr. Smith as a coach at best and a day laborer at worst. They can't conceive of him of being a college professor. This will likely sound familiar to black professionals who are in the room. What's wrong with this picture? White man who's a suspect in a homicide case and a black man who might have committed some burglary, whose picture is bigger, more prominently featured, and who takes up more copy in, in the- More space. In the, more space in the newspaper. That was from Mississippi. Here's two. You might be familiar with the Serena Williams cartoon. Um, this is a cartoon that folks put together about how unarmed black men look to the police. So these images also impact the way that we police. We often think about the, the image of, uh, on the left of your screen, when we think about the case of Mike Brown. When Darren Wilson um, was, after Darren Wilson murdered Mike Brown, the question was, you know, what was going on? Why did you pull the trigger? And he said he was afraid. He said, when I grabbed him, the only way I can describe it is I felt like a five-year-old holding on to Hulk Hogan. These are Darren Wilson's words. Mike Brown is 6'4", 290. Darren Wilson is also 6'4", although he weighs a little bit less at 210. But he perceives Mike Brown as being much, much bigger, superhuman. 
So a similar response came from the police officer who, saw, who shot Terrence Crutcher in Tulsa. She said, he looked like a monster. He kept coming at me, even though in fact he had his hands raised and he was walking the opposite direction. But also it's quite possibly how Amy, Amy Cooper saw Christian Cooper, who was trying to bird watch in Central Park. And she called the police. We're gonna end with a video um, that really encapsulates the whole issue of representation. And race.
That's the end of the formal part of the presentation. Uh, representation matters. So we are looking forward to some conversation. All right, I want to thank you so much, Dr. Smith and Dr. Hattery. That was a very powerful presentation. And I think a conversation for that for many is uncomfortable. So I want to just go into a conversation and then we're going to go to the Q&A. Uh, Monica sent over some great questions from, uh, from many of the attendees. Uh, but just on the conversational part, something that we mentioned in, uh, when we talked about this previously, is that many people in white America, uh, quote unquote, uh, become very... Um, defensive at the concept of white privilege. They become very uncomfortable with the conversations. You know, they'll say, well, I woke up at three o'clock in the morning and I, I worked hard for everything I got. I didn't have white privilege. Can you kind of break down that and explain how when we say white privilege, we're not saying that you had everything easy, everything given to you, but rather that things were simply different than they were for somebody who might be of a different ethnic background. I'm so happy you asked that question because that's really in some ways the million dollar question. And I think um, part of what can be very difficult for white people to do is hold two things in their head at the same time. One of those is that I can work very hard. And the other is that I also had privileges or opportunities that other people didn't have. Um, I, I sometimes think about things like, um, what would it look like for black people or for women or for folks in the LGBTQ plus community? How much more might they have achieved if they didn't have to climb over so many extra hurdles or if they got an earlier start? Um, what does it mean when, uh, look, I think I worked very hard. Like Dr. Smith said, I earned a PhD. I worked very hard, um, you know, got up early, went to work, made good decisions. Um, but I don't have to worry about many of the things that my friends of color have to worry about or folks in the LGBTQ plus community have to worry about. And I also have the advantage of many generations of people who were able to own land, who were able to own property, who were able to build equity, who will be able to send kids to college without inc incurring the same amount of debt. So I can work hard and have also had privileges at the same time. And I think white people need to really think hard about being able to hold both of those concepts in their head at the same time. And, you know, uh, sociologists have paid attention to this um, uh, notion of social class. And one of the things that passes around every 10 years or so is that America is a classless society and that everybody has access to upward mobility. It ain't so. Everybody does not have access to upward mobility. And so the character that you described as getting up in the morning and going to work at 3 a.m., well, he wasn't going to Wall Street at 3 a.m., that's for sure. Um, so social class is also important, and it's something that we as a society don't really grapple with until after this uh, murder of George Floyd, there is so much information coming our way about uh, class inequality. It's everywhere. And so I would just say, that gentleman worked hard, but so did I. Here's one question is white people love to say that, but black people worked hard for free for several <laughs> exactly. hundred years. Exactly. And then we have laws and policies that were put in place. I mean, the Homestead Act, uh, some of the, 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 the GI Bill, where 
uh, blacks had difficulties. Well, most people after World War II didn't access the bill, but blacks had difficulties accessing the bill. Um, FDR did some things. I mean, it's, it's complicated and it's cemented into the policies and practices, not just the individual uh, examples that we can talk about. It, it is embedded in the policies and practices with the founding of this nation. And this is why we started off with Jefferson and lines of dissent and so on and so forth. Um, hey, we all work hard, but some, you know, it's like Orwell. Uh, all the animals in the, in, the, in, the, in the yard are equal, but guess what? Some are more equal than others. And, and that's know, the society we live in. Ab absolutely. You know, on that point, Dr. Smith, I, I want to go into kind of what you were saying about Jefferson. Um, Condoleezza Rice once said that racism is the birth defect of America, it's the fundamental flaw of America. And part of the reason that we've never come to terms and to a reckoning with this is, as you said, the kind of propaganda form of history that we're taught in school. Um, you know, the way they make it sound is that slavery was like a weekend project uh, and that it was done after, you know, uh, you know we were done after a couple of days and you know, everything's fine after that. Um, even the way that we teach black history in America, we teach the black history fairy tale. You know, one day Abraham Lincoln, <clears throat> Abraham Lincoln and Martin Luther King were having breakfast. Um, they decided to pick up Rosa Parks on the <laughs> Underground Railroad of Harriet Tubman. They went from Selma to Montgomery. Then once they got to D.C., they did the I Have a Dream speech and Barack Obama was president and racism was over. And that's the way that we teach black history in America. And that's um, the concept that many people have. Can you dive into a little bit that concept of race at the founding of our country and the fluid nature that it has had over the centuries um, leading into where we are today? The first part is that uh, it, it, it's interesting, and I'm of the generation to know this, that you had to fight to teach this thing we call black history. You had to fight for it because it wasn't being taught. And especially when we understand the nature of the segregated school system in American society, then and now. So that part of it was fought for and it's still being fought for. When you have a people who are deemed less than human, from the beginning, less than human. And then you codify it by saying, if you're this color or you're some other color, then you rise or fall on, on the scale. Uh, disproportionately, blacks were always at the bottom. I tell this story, or I, I, I use this example in class and I ask the students, uh, you know, you got a white family on one side of the street, you got a black family on the other side of the street. There's only two houses on the street. One of the houses catches fire. Excuse me, both houses catch, it, catch fire. The, amble, the fire folks come in. One truck. Which house are they going to go to? It's, I mean, and that classroom is dead silent because nobody wants to raise their hand to address that question. Which house is that fire truck going to go to? I think part of the reason that we wanted to start with Jefferson is an accumulated frustration. Um, and I think it gets expressed as how many black men have to be shot before we're gonna take this seriously and before we're gonna move the needle. And I think what we decided to start with Jefferson because the needle isn't gonna move unless we actually address the fundamental problem. I thought about it today, it's like the foundation of the house. So all of a sudden the house is, the, the roof is on fire or water is pouring in and no one bothers to go see what is the crack in the foundation. And until we're willing to have honest conversation, but it's not just conversation, until we're willing to interrogate policies and practices and, and you know, rebalance power, um, we're not, we're gonna continue to have, it's gonna continue to happen. 
It's just going to well, continue. And, and a t- a turn into one of our questions uh, from, from the audience. Uh, <laughs> someone said, <clears throat> someone once told me that racism is built into America the way vanilla extract is built into a pound cake. If you're allergic to vanilla, you have to throw the cake out and start anew. Is that uh, is that the, the only way to fix America to start anew? So what are some solutions that we should have? What are some things we need to look into um, to solve this birth defect, to solve the fact that if you scratch just below the surface of almost everything in American society, it's built upon a, a foundation of racism, segregation, xenophobia, uh, subjugation, uh, so on and so forth. How, how do we move on from that point? I, I mean, that's that's the million dollar question. You wanted to, um, <laughs> you wanted to wait until it last to deal with that. <laughs> that's a hard question. Um, I mean, here's the thing. We can't turn back the clock, right? We can't actually unbake the cake. Um, we can't do that. So what can we do? And I think the first point is understanding that there's vanilla in the cake and that people are allergic to it, that race is baked into the Constitution, and then to develop policies and practices. And hard as it's going to be for white people, it's going to be redistributing power and resources. Um, that's going to have to happen. I don't, I don't see any other way forward um, other than having, and, and we have friends who are economists who have some strategies um, for thinking about how to do that logistically. Um, but outside of turning back the clock 400 years, I don't think affirmative action has not moved the needle. I don't think, uh, you know, training people around implicit bias isn't going to change it because none of that gets at the structural causes of the problem. We need a justice system that works for everyone. We need, we need a justice system that's not two-tiered uh, justice system. I take the example of the, 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 the prosecutors who had the guts uh, to come on and testify in front of Congress this past week or two weeks ago uh, and sat there and told us that they were afraid or some of their colleagues were afraid to bring forth the charges against Roger Stone. When I look up and I see Paul Manafort walking out of prison, I see Michael Cohen walking out of prison, I see Mike Flynn never going to prison, and then old Ray Ray, who may not have committed the crime to begin with, is sitting in there decade after decade after decade. It's a a two-tier system that doesn't work for black people. What can you do? One, treat Treat people as humans. We talked about the three-fifth clause. Uh, When these police kill people and we see it on TV and then they're acquitted through some, we're not lawyers, so you folks in the room who are lawyers, you know about this stuff, through some technical whatever, and then the cops walk walk out free or they're put on a desk relief with pay after they've taken a life. I mean, everybody can see this But because of the way the system is rigged from the very beginning, it works against black people. And, you know, on on that point, we are talking about this concept of solutions. Another question from the audience. Um, What makes race such a sticky issue? Even when we know the impact of race and racism and know how and know that it's a social construct that we've created ourselves, why is it so hard for us to uh, for us to rid ourselves of it? And this goes into a conversation we're having Sunday uh, about the way that we went from uh, you know, the way that whiteness went from being a Northern European Anglo-Saxon Protestant, then eventually it included the Irish, it included the Catholics, and whiteness then encompassed Italians and Mediterraneans. Is this almost blob that absorbs things. So why haven't we been able to just rid ourselves of this uh, construct and move on from there? Well, I mean, first of all, you have to admit that it's real. Um, I think that, I I mean, I can only speak for myself and my observations, but I I don't think that there's many things that white people would rather talk less about than race. White people don't want to see themselves complicit in the system. Um, It's one thing to talk about my individual level of prejudice, Um, But it's really, really a different conversation to talk about white privilege and structural racism. Um, And and I'm pretty convinced that, I mean, your point is so well taken because 
a lot of times, people, let, me, let me come at it a different direction. A lot of times people ask us, why didn't you write a book about other people besides black people? Why is the book policing black bodies and not policing Latinx bodies or policing Asian bodies? And the reason is because it's at the foundational definition of race, all centered on black and white and who had legal status and citizenship status and who okay. did it. And as people immigrate into the United States on their own, by the way, not necessarily dragged on a slave ship, um, kidnapped, but they come into the United States. They don't all come in with full citizenship. That's a thousand percent true. And there's a lot of um, prejudice and discrimination against immigrants, but they don't come in as three fifths of a human being. That's one of the key differences, right? And so when we've started with that structure, we can absorb certain groups if they behave like citizens. So after your radio program, we did a little bit of more research about the Italians becoming white. And it turns out that a, a major marker, a, an article written by Brent, Sta Brent Staples in the New York Times, he argued that the Italians became white when FDR ruled Columbus Day a national holiday right. because right. Columbus is Italian, right? And so Italian people must be white if there's going to be a national holiday honoring him. Um, there's not going to be a national holiday recognizing black people that is going to whiten them, right? That's just not going to happen, um, which I just think is an interesting, <laughs> we're, we, we got to acknowledge the vanilla in the cake before we can do any of the other work that needs to happen. I will say, I will add to what Dr. Smith said. I also think there's a both and while we're trying to tear down systemic racism and structural patriarchy and all that stuff, we also should be working to make things better for people who have to live in the moment, right? So we can both be reformers and reconstructionists, if you will. So we can work on both of those projects at the same time. And, and, and kind of piggybacking on that point, another, the, another one of the questions that came in uh, is this question of, you were talking about Columbus Day becoming a holiday. What we've seen the last couple of weeks is all of a sudden, you know, white people discover what Juneteenth was. Um, <laughs> President Trump said he made it very, very famous. You know, nobody knew what it was until he um, uh, started talking about it. Uh, how have you seen the differences between the way people are treating the Fourth of July and uh, and other ho and versus Juneteenth and other holidays? Now that we are having more conversations about race, um, you know, kind of those expectations of for African Americans to have the same reverence from July Fourth, uh, seventeen seventy six, when at that time we did not receive our freedom. So, how do you see this honoring of different days being different now that we're having real conversations? just become another part of the commercialization of uh, race and ethnicity. Um, companies, corporations, they have huge marketing, uh, huge public relations uh, units, and they figure out ways to sell products on this new level of consciousness. Juneteenth, uh, t-shirts uh, all over the place, Amazon has it up. Uh, you turn on your computer and Google is advertising, you know, that they love black people, et cetera, and so forth. But when you dig down and you look at the personnel structure in places like Google and places like Facebook, uh, it's not evident that they hire black people. They don't work there. They don't work there in any significant way in positions that make decisions. It doesn't exist in corporate America. Um, holidays are great as, as long as they're paid holidays. Uh, go back and look at the uh, it, you know, the beginning of Martin Luther King holiday and all the trouble that surrounded that holiday to things like the sporting venues, not going to certain states because those states wouldn't honor the holiday. Uh, so it's not even equal in that sense, the commercialization of, of holidays around race and ethnicity. Uh, it's probably good that people now know about Juneteenth. But if you've been reading that black history that you talked about, uh, Robert, earlier, uh, it's all there. It's there. Lerone Bennett, who was a uh, 
outstanding historian for uh, the Ebony Magazine uh, structure, uh, Johnson's Ebony Magazine structure. He always talked about Juneteenth, not only in the magazine, but also in the books that he's, he's published. Um, so we know about that. Now it's just gotten airtime vis-a-vis because of these tragedies, police brutality that had hit American society on TV. I'd love to give a quick example from the world of gender. Um, and I use this often in my classes that I think um, microaggressions are very painful. Microaggressions are like being killed by a thousand lashes. Um, but it's the structural disadvantages that actually impact most of our lives more. So the example of Amazon leads me to think about the example of pay inequity. So I don't like it when my colleagues mistreat me or sexually harass me in the hall or whatever all those things are. But what really impacts my life is I make 70 cents on a white man's dollar. So I'm only making 70% of what the guy down the hall is making for doing the same job. And at the end of our lives, when we dip into our retirement accounts, that's going to hurt me a whole lot more. And so I think to the point about Amazon, I'm glad that, you know, all of these companies are drawing attention, but until you hire black people and promote black people up through the ranks, um, it's, it's got to walk the walk. Yep. All right, I want to touch uh, quickly on implicit bias, as uh, Dr. Smith mentioned earlier, uh, you know, being mistaken for a uh, gardener and being mistaken for uh, you know, basketball coach. I, I know myself as, as a younger man, I was always followed around stores because they thought I was stealing. As a middle-aged man, uh, they always come up to me and ask if I work there. So, you know, if I'm, if I'm wearing a blue shirt anywhere near a Best Buy um, <laughs> or, uh, you know, or anything red or orange at Home Depot, I'm, you know, showing people drills and stuff. And I, <laughs> the only reason I say that is because it happened this morning. Um, but on, on that point, implicit bias goes deeper <laughs> in that it infects the criminal justice system. It goes into age overestimation for younger African Americans, uh, racial profiling. Uh, so I wanted you guys to talk a little bit about what creates these implicit biases and ways to, uh, to break out of them. Stereotypes. Stereotypes. Um, I wrote a book on sport, race and sport. And I remember writing about what is it that uh, young black men and women can do going into adulthood. And it was singing and dancing and playing some type of sport. And so you build these stereotypes about people and it becomes a part of the dominant ideology. These things don't exist, you know, behind closed doors. Uh, then you get whole states like Texas, for example, that buys their textbooks from somewhere and distributing these textbooks across the whole state public school system. And everybody's absorbing the same negative stereotypes about black people. And so this is where, I don't use the term implicit bias often, but this is where these biases come from. And then you're sitting, you're in class and you're, you're, you're laying out your discussion, interactive discussion with your students and inevitably a hand goes up and the student can be white, black, Latinx, whatever. And they say, oh my gosh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that about Thomas Jefferson. I didn't know that about something else. And it takes a lot of work, which is what we're also hearing about now, to undo those belief systems. It takes a lot of work to get rid of them. It's hard. People, people right now, as I said in the opening, are struggling with trying to undo all these things they learn over time, growing up. Officially, inside the school system, officially inside the church, officially inside the home. This is a lot of stuff up here. This is, this is a lot of stuff you've taken in and now you have to unlearn it. That's painful and it's difficult. I think another important point about representation, there's something called the dissimilarity index. Yep. And the dissimilarity index is essentially how segregated or integrated your world is. And the truth is that for most white people, 
the index of dissimilarity is very, very high. We spend almost all of our time with other white people. We see only certain images of black people. We may not know any black people or know very few. And, and only the people we know might be the people who cut our lawn or cook our food or whatever. So where you see some of these things show up. Um, you teach at an institution that's, uh, you teach at a private liberal arts college that happens to have a football team. Turns out that of all the black men on that campus, 50% of them play on the football team. So you ask white students, how many black men do you think are on campus? They have this huge estimation because they watch a football game on Saturday and the only faces they see are black. Right? Basketball. Or basketball, right? So when white people don't have friendships, interactions, or a wide variety of representation, um, they, they, it's very easy for stereotypes and implicit bias to, to be the only thing that they have to draw on. And, and uh, on, kind of piggybacking off that point, I'm going to transition into another one of the questions from, uh, from the audience. But that's kind of a string of Kantism that was articulated by Sartre and by Simone de Beauvoir and even Franz Fanon when they were discussing otherness and the, uh, uh, when uh, de Beauvoir was discussing it with regards to the feminine voice and then Frantz Fanon within the, uh, uh, the anti-colonial struggle uh, voice, they all discussed the fact of being black or being female or being uh, Jewish or being a, uh, outside of the mainstream of being fundamentally other and the inability of the, uh, the colonial or the uh, majority society to have, a, um, to have an understanding of that otherness. They think they're helping often. Um, so going to one of the questions is, how do we have these discussions and also take into consideration or deal with white fragility um, as a term, which is a term that I just learned about three seconds ago um, in these conversations? How do you, how do you uh, deal with that without, you know, things becoming defensive, people going to their corners, turning into an attack versus or trying to have an open conversation? So I'm going to be, be honest. So um, as a white person doing anti-racist work, I have felt, always, but especially in the last couple months, that one of the things I needed to do as a white person was talk to white people, um, that that shouldn't be the burden of my black and brown friends, that it should be white people need to do that hard work, especially when, white, when the white people you're talking to are feeling defensive, right? And so I put together a reading list thinking, okay, some white folks, like if you want to do so, educate yourself. Don't ask your black friend what, you know, what to do, educate yourself. And I put white fragility on that list, the book. And I got beat up badly, partly because why was I advertising a book that, you know, that white person had written? Um, why not elevate the voices of black people? And if you actually look at what I recommended, it was a pretty uh, diverse list. But, but I think that I had a conversation with a graduate student who might be in the room today. So if you are, Rochelle, thank you. Um, a black graduate student about this as well. For white people who've never thought about these issues, I think they need to start with something like white fragility and probably in conversations with other white people until they've learned enough and gotten through some defensiveness to be able to handle some of the more critical work. So, so for example, you know, I highly recommend the book Eloquent Rage by Brittany Cooper, but I don't think a white person who's not thought about race before can start with that. I think that that work really needs to be done among white people first, so that when white people come to the table, they can hear what black people have to say. They can basically shut up and listen for a while um, and hear what black people have, have to say. So do your homework. Don't depend on other people to do it for you. But I also don't think it's fair to come to the table, not having done work, and ultimately microaggressing black folks who are trying to help you out. I don't know that that really gets at the answer, but... Yeah, all right, and um, and in the interest of time, I'm going to combo two questions together and kind of tie it into what we're um, discussing because part uh, part of the uh, this issue of otherness is a is kind of built into the society as we were talking about vanilla and the cake as one of the earlier questions asked, um, and so a two two part question uh, put together is that uh, does our capitalistic system necessitate there being an underclass, and is this is simply a uh, a, a symptom of our system that we make this class divide, a racial divide, um, but what are, won't there always just be somebody that has to be on the bottom? First, the first part is yes. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you read 
the serious literature on class, uh, it's clear that capitalism is a system that functions the way we see it functioning now. Um, will some body or some groups of people be on the bottom? Uh, I, I'm not. Well, I guess I'm I not sure that they have to be. Um, we we talk today about different societies and the way they pay for these troubled times where people are out of work. Uh, they you know they can't. Uh, send their kids off to childcare, and in some of those countries, because they're not tied up in Afghanistan uh, and this place and that place, policing the world through armies, uh, they can provide those funds to citizens in the country in ways that we don't provide those funds. You you talked about yeah. That. I mean, I guess I would say on the one hand. You read Karl Marx. Karl Marx says capitalism depends on a surplus labor pool, and that surplus labor pool is people who are unemployed. So for capitalism to thrive, yes, there has to be a group of people who are at the bottom. That's just built into the definition. Um, I think one of the most interesting things um, that, uh, you know, sociologists who look at class um, it turns out that the less inequality there is about on race or gender, the less inequality there is in general. So, so countries that have less inequality have less inequality for everyone. Will everybody be at the same spot? Of course not, because talents and work ethic and all of that isn't distributed equally to everyone. But the distance between folks would be much more narrow um, in systems that are not as you know, hyper-capitalist and neoliberal as the US. And, and I think that the second point to make about that is, in the US, it looks, it, you could make the observation that talent and work ethic is distributed by race. When in fact, that doesn't make it, of course it's not, right? Of course it's not. So if, it, if you actually had a culture, a society where people rose and fell on their work ethic and their talents, it wouldn't be racially stratified or stratified by gender. It would be stratified by talents, right? Yeah, uh, another of the questions coming in, and we're we're uh, getting close oh, to the end tonight. of our time. So, like I said, every time we have these conversations, we need like twelve hours to have this discussion. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, how? Oh, go ahead. No, I I just wanted to add to the capitalism question uh, to keep you know issues practical and everyday issues. Look at the way this most recent round of stimulus money was distributed. It was supposed to go to those who need it the most. We now know a little bit about it because it's secretive. Public funds were distributed, but now it's secretive, so you don't really know where the money went. We do know that uh, Black-owned uh, businesses. Black businesses receive less. We do know that people that live in Washington, D.C. receive less because they're not a state you know, this isn't something that they choose. They live in D.C., that's where they live, but they receive less. We know that uh, many companies that have billions and billions of dollars in savings also receive the money. So capitalism works in that way. From the beginning, for me to make a profit, I have to exploit you. It's built, I mean, that's the most basic part of capitalism. Otherwise, I wouldn't make a profit. So why, why should I be in this business? Um, so yeah, capitalism works that way. And there's going to be an underclass. Mm. Sure. And, and we, 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 see, we see the underclass in the so-called uh, strange term attached to essential workers. It's very, very strange. Look into it. This is the underclass who have been given this golden label as essential workers to bring us our pizzas and, 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 and coffee and whatnot, and look at who they are. 
It, it is very interesting the, uh, uh, that conversation was, I think, Americans having a lot of conversations we weren't ready to have. Um, what, one of them that I think has been uh, interesting, so uh, Georgia, we have a Senator Kelly Loeffler, um, and they, uh, they were showing her a video of people at the Wendy's where Rashard Brooks was killed at. Um, and there were African-American men there open carrying their, uh, their firearms to help keep the area safe because police had done a mass blue flu uh, sick out and they wanted to ensure they were ensuring the safety of the community. Uh, Kelly Loeffler described that as a mob. Um, mm -hmm. Then you have the situation, I think yesterday in St. Louis, where the protesters were peaceably walking down the street. Um, a, two lawyers in a multi-million dollar mansion and a multi-million dollar subdivision ran outside barefoot holding AR-15s and pistols and started pointing them at people. And that has been retweeted and held up as patriots upholding their Second Amendment right to defend their homes. Can you kind of describe what it is, uh, is about America where one group defending their community is called a mob or called thugs or called a gang when they're actually professionals in the community who are defending their neighborhoods and others are described as patriots for doing a similar action? So uh, on the one hand, I just, it seems simple. Like that's the definition of white privilege, right? Um, it's a definition not only of individual white privilege, but again, if we go back and, and go back to the articles of the Constitution, and we had one of them up in the slides, uh, when the Constitution was written, the right to bear arms, um, the right to assemble, the right to free speech, those were not rights that Black people had, because Black people were not citizens, right? So from the jump, from the very beginning, um, white people have had those privileges, and they be we believe they belong to us, right? We believe they belong to us and not to other people. Another example that I've seen floating around a lot on Facebook were armed militia who showed up at the Capitol in Michigan demanding that the governor there open up the economy. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that the that sort of the vanilla baked in the cake coupled with um, stereotypes and implicit bias and representation, when those two things get in a brew together, that's exactly what you see, 100%. And there's a there's a there's an African American woman I think in St. Louis a district attorney maybe famous she's in the news a lot fighting with the police unions etc and she says that she's going to attempt to investigate this this activity that you described well it's gone it's 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 past it's over um, thankfully nobody got shot nobody got hurt but they had the right, like we all are supposed to have the right to bear arms, to protect our property, our family, and so on and so forth, but it doesn't work equally. I mean, there's tons of examples, and we use some in the book, where Blacks call the police because of some disturbance, and they end up getting arrested, getting arrested or killed. And so on, on, on that point, uh, one of the questions we had come in says, and we talked about this uh, a little bit previously, why did you guys use the terminology black bodies instead of black people? Because yeah. I mean, that's a very important point that people need to understand the difference. Yeah, and we, that's, we do get this question very often. Um, it was a very deliberate choice and it was the choice, to, and the choice centers around um, wanting to highlight this, this history of the politicization, the political construction of black bodies as not fully human. Um, and, it, and if you read the book, we use the term black bodies. We also use the term black people when we're talking about black people, um, but really wanting to emphasize the point that um, it's this fundamental decision of rendering black people as not fully invisible. human, um, as invisible, as bodies to be commodified um, rather than people to receive rights and privileges. Um, so it's, it's, yeah. Deliberate. Very, very absolutely deliberate. And, and we have to footnote it a little bit, borrowed from a fantastic book by a black feminist named Dorothy Roberts, who wrote a book called Killing the Black Body. Um, and it's, it's a very powerful read. Um, and, and we felt like it was, it, it applied here. So th always thank you for that question. All right, and, and so one of the questions we had come in is, how do you convince white people that this is a conversation worth having? 
then you know um nobody ever likes to watch a movie where you end up being the bad guy in the movie uh you know very few uh big blockbusters do the avengers end up losing like oh no they were the bad guys the whole time uh, so how do you convince uh white people in, in moss not you know your liberal arts friends but just regular ones uh or regular everyday average you know the folks that this is a conversation they need to take part in so as individuals you don't all the conversation <laughs> about white privilege would lead you to conclude that white people don't have anything to gain from this conversation and yet when we look systematically whether it's the segregated south during jim crow or currently um Many, many white people actually also pay a really high price for racism. If you think about the segregated South, for example, um, it, under Jim Crow, it was costly to have to build two of everything. Even if the, the, the swimming pools and the movie theaters and the hospitals and the schools that black people were able to go to or utilize were inferior, it still cost twice the amount of money to build double the facilities, right? Um, a really fantastic book by Jonathan Metzl called Dying by Whiteness um, examines the way in which white people are so deeply committed to whiteness that they will make political decisions that actually go against their best interest. So they will vote against the Affordable Care Act because they don't want black people to get that No, no, benefit. no, no. They, they, they don't vote against the Affordable Care Act. They vote against Obamacare. Obamacare, right. They'll vote against Obamacare um, or they'll vote to preserve Second Amendment rights even when people in their communities are dying at much higher rates, right? Number one um, cause of death for young black men, middle class, middle aged black men is suicide by gun, right? And so helping white people understand that black we actually, white, white, white men, men, that we actually also pay a cost, right? Um, I'll stop there. <laughs> Understood. Uh, last question I want to try to get to is uh, one of the one of the comments is to the point of implicit bias. What suggestions do you have for prosecutors when dealing with victims who may be impacted by their in implicit bias? Uh, for example, when they report a crime uh, to begin with, when they are pushing for a more severe sentence. Uh, how do you uh, how do you help people take that implicit bias out as a prosecutor? Oh gosh, that's a really good question. Um, and talking about witnesses, that's a really good question. The prosecutor has implicit bias. No, the 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 reporting person, the the victim in the crime has implicit bias. I mean, data. I, I don't know. I feel like data talks. Give them an implicit bias test and see how they do on it. Um, but I think, I think this is really one of the most difficult things and hopefully folks will come back for the second installation or read in the book. One of the things that we do a lot of research around is ex are wrongful convictions and exonerations. And as all most probably of you in the room who study the law know, once something gets embedded in your head as a witness, it's very, very difficult to unseat that. And so I think unseating implicit bias is a, is a huge challenge. Um, I would love to hear from folks who are who are we prosecutors what advice you have because that's a that's a really tough one. All right, and be, before we run out of time, I want to turn it over to Bonnie. Um, what are some last thoughts for for both of you that you want people to take away from this particular part of the conversation? Well, um, the you know learning learning is important. Uh, these particular times give us the opportunity to learn something about our uh, Black neighbors, uh, the people we work with, um, you know, quit asking Black women at work, you know, how did you do this with your hair? Um, don't touch the hair. Don't touch it. Uh, just pay attention to the time that we're living in and be honest with yourself. Um, when we see injustices, I think we have to call them for what they are. Uh, we have to speak to many of these problems that exist in the workplace, in our schools, and if we don't do it, then nobody else is going to do it. So we can't wait on somebody else to do it for us. So this is how we end the book. We end the book with what other choice do we have? What if we can't figure this out? 
where do we go as a society if we continue to exacerbate racial inequality and police black bodies? We will implode. We won't survive into the next century, right? We must take the mantle. And I think that's, that's what we're seeing happen right now. We're at a really important moment. Um, and what, what happens if we don't? Very Langston Hughes of you, very dream deferred. Uh, so exactly. want wanted to thank you guys so much. I did not expect this conversation to go into Kantism, Marxism, Langston Hughes, <laughs> the Beauvoir, France for now. Yeah, who, who knew we were getting there, but we got there. You guys are amazing. You're outstanding. I want to turn it back over to Bonnie Hoffman uh, for some closing thoughts. Thank you so much. Bonnie, you want the slides? So if you could put up the slides, and I'm going to tell you first to actually put up the slide for your book because one of the things we've seen in the chat a lot is some questions about the book and wanting to buy the book. And the good news is that the publisher of the book is offering a special discount. Um, and so the code is there on the slide for you. Um, and I think Angie and Earl uh, should probably also share with you that a second edition of the book is in the works uh, as we speak. I mean, yeah. So um, th that's the first thing. So, I want to, on behalf of myself, uh, our partners, uh, and NACDL, to thank all of you for being so willing to not only take your time and share your, your knowledge, but to share your own experiences and to be willing to be vulnerable. As, as we can see from a lot of this conversation, um, some of the challenge is being ready and being open to even having the conversation and to sharing these experiences this way. And so from, you know, from... Uh, me personally, and, and on behalf of uh, our organizations and our partner organizations, we really can't thank you enough.